I'm thrilled to be talking today with Leah Gordon. She is an associate dean at Boston College, where she focuses on inclusive excellence, diversity, and belonging. She's also an associate professor of the practice. So what that means is she spends time not just at Boston College, but also spends one day a week in nursing, partic particularly in oncology. She is a, before this, a diversity director for nursing and patient care at Mass General Hospital. And she has many degrees, which you probably will go into today, but with a bachelor's, a master's of science, a family nurse practitioner's degrees in nursing from Regis College. And she also got her doctor of nursing practice also from Regis College. I'm so thrilled to have you here, Leah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the time. Leah, let's talk about your identity, how you identify, and how did your upbringing guide you to this career? Yeah, so I actually identify um, on paper and anything that I have to apply for as Black, but I um, I ethnically didn't uh, identify as Afro Latina. Um, I am, my father is a uh, black American man. My mother is a woman who uh, came from Panama. Uh, I unfortunately don't speak Spanish because um, when I was growing up uh, in the seventies, my father was of the mindset that if my brother and I were bilingual, it would actually slow us down in education. And now we know that that's quite the opposite and it's unfortunate that that happened, but I do feel very close to my Panamanian culture. My mother's one of 18 children. Um, so I have lots of uh, aunts and uncles and cousins. And um, really, actually, my aspiration is to be living um, within the United States and Panama at some point um, um, in my lifetime. Um, I, I do feel very uh connected to my Black heritage as well. Um, I know that when people see me, that's what they see first. And I am a very proud um, Black woman, a very proud Afro-Latina woman. Um, I use the she series as my pronouns. And, um, you know, my uh, dedication towards diversity, equity, and inclusion work, as well as um, healthcare really does come from my parents. My father and my mother met at a community health center here in Boston. Uh, my father at one point ran the Soldiers Home, uh, which is a veterans hospital in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Uh, he himself uh, was a, a veteran, a Vietnam vet. Um, and so between my mother and my father and their commitment to uh, marginalized communities, disenfranchised communities, and always showing ways to elevate their voices, um, that really um, resonated with me. I did not know that this would turn into a nursing career. There's a whole nother story about that that hopefully we'll have time to talk about. But I knew that my um, my truth and my upbringing was to make sure that marginalized voices, women, uh, people of color, uh, socioeconomically disenfranchised um, veterans at that time was going to be really a focus for me in my life. Obviously, that has expanded to include, um, a, you know, ableism, LBGTQ plus community. Um, so it's expanded, my commitment to this work has expanded as um, more people, unfortunately, have become marginalized in this country. Leah, I wanna to go to your upbringing and how your parents met, it really fueled this passion of giving voice to marginalized communities. And you started your career in getting an associate's degree actually from a community college. And I didn't read that, but there were like six other degrees that you got. You're very committed to education, and I'm sure that your parents drove that. But why? Yeah. Why so many? My my mom is a nurse, and yeah. I think she got two two degrees. Yeah. So I'm yeah. just curious, like, why did you have to get so many? What was that about? Yeah, so I have four degrees, and all of the degrees are in nursing. And um, my proudest degree, and I've always said this, uh, and I'm committed to saying this, is my associate degree uh, from a community college here in Massachusetts. Um, I do feel like I was given such an, a wonderful education, um, a very strong foundation of how to be a very good bedside nurse. And truly, that's where I saw myself. Uh, that's where I saw myself as an accomplishment, and I was totally fine staying there. 
a few things uh, before I get into the degrees is um, I actually became a mother when I was 19 years old and um, was not taking uh, my college education at that time very seriously. So to lose education, to lose that opportunity for education in a uh, place of being a mother uh, actually helped me value education a lot more than I did initially. Um, I wasn't able to go back to school to get that associate's degree till my daughter was uh, four or five years old and then um, didn't complete that degree till she was about six or seven. Um, and the reason why I uh, really pushed through to get uh, all these degrees is, um, you know, I, I would say that nursing is a marginalized profession. It's mostly female um, uh, dominant profession. Um, a, a lot of times um, nurses are handmaids uh, in many ways to our physician colleagues. Um, I am fortunate because I've actually worked among uh, physicians who actually value my role um, and see the importance of nursing, but I would say not every nurse has had that experience, so I feel very fortunate that I have. But uh, the nursing profession, as a marginalized profession, as a marginalized per person in the profession, sort of has always told me that I'm I've just, you know, having a degree, the degrees that I've had has not been enough. So I got my associate degree, decided that it was important for me to go on and get my bachelor's and my master's degree, and got into a program that actually had this upward mobility uh, where they took nurses who had associate degree and helped them be, get, get their bachelor's and then get their master's. So that was really great. Um, and then when I got my master's, I thought I was done. I was, you know, I, I got my master's degree and I was a nurse practitioner with that. And I was very excited about becoming an advanced clinician, thought I would be able to teach at that point. And then the profession said, no, nope, that's not enough. We have a, ter you know, a terminal degree. And I never wanted to get my PhD, but there's this new, it's newer. I shouldn't say it's new. I mean, it's been around. Um, I got my, my uh, doctorate of nursing practice in 2017 but it's been around even a little bit before that. But because the profession told me, no, you are you are not enough in the profession to teach with a master's degree, you gotta go one more step. And you know, I, I reluctantly took that step. I'm glad that I did now, but I took that step because I just was like, look, I need to get to a place as a woman of color in this marginalized profession where people have, have to stop telling me no. No, you can't because you don't have the degree, you know, so I got the uh, doctor of nursing practice with a focus on cultural competence and nursing education. That journey in itself was hugely laced with issues um, um, that, in my opinion, had to do with a lot of racism. Um, but I did achieve that degree in 2017. And now I have a terminal degree and people can't tell me no. And then I get eligible for associate dean positions because I have a terminal degree and that's pretty cool, right? Because they would have told me no when I had my master's, right? So the, the terminal degree has opened up a lot for me and it's all of the journey, the associate, the bachelor, the master's, and even the doctorate degree has completely enhanced my nursing practice, as well as my commitment towards DEI work and in nursing education, as well as overall nursing education. It's so interesting, this idea of not being enough, not having enough, not getting enough degrees. I have a lot of degrees too, Leah. So in, in sisterhood of saying like, did we need all those degrees? It's nice. Yes, we have opportunities because of these degrees. But there's a difference between, hey, if you get this degree, it does qualify you for other roles versus you're not enough. And you don't know, we don't trust you walking in the door, seeing your face. You've got to prove it. So I'd like to talk about that because as women of color, that is unique. We have both women and of color that can really hold us back. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, Leah, what myths, what beliefs, ideas, did you believe or were told to you that now you realize, actually, you know what, Annalisa, so that's, that's bunk. What comes to mind for you? Yeah. So I, th I think that's an excellent question. So there's two big things that come to mind for me. One is um, the idea of not being enough and onlyness in this profession. A lot of times, at least in this, the part of the world that I live in, there are a lot of wonderful nursing programs and there are a lot of wonderful nurses um, out in the field, but there are not a lot of uh, nurses of color. So I've been in only 
in in many and all of the spaces that I exist in. Um, even for example, in my current department, um, and I'm not including residents or trainees, but I'm the only black clinician in our in our um, department we're at the hospital I work in now. I don't think that um, my, dep my department wants it that way, but it also speaks to like, how do we get more people into the profession? And that's a whole nother story in itself. Um, but, you know, I think, um, so I think about this loneliness that I've experienced, especially as a black nurse in oncology settings, I've been one of only's, um, a lot and, um, it's, it's, there's definitely this uh, voice, you put somebody in the corner, you're basically telling them you're not enough. <laughs> and the only way you're gonna really be enough to work here is to get that bachelor's degree to meet this designation that the hospital has. So it's it's this quandary that you get caught in between like your personal values and your personal desires and what you wanna do and then what a system is bearing down upon you to do. And also the the other thing I think about is, you know, as I mentioned, when I got my um my doctoral degree, I was told by um the faculty in that program back in 2017 that they thought my work was important, but they had no idea. They said basically they said, we think your work is important, but we don't know who's going to prioritize this. Mm -hmm. So it was like we let you do a project about something that we think is important, but we don't know if it's going to actually ever take you anywhere in your career. Well, turns out that I was uh, an assistant director at one school for um, multicultural programming. I was uh, a, a, a director for diversity at a major hospital, and now when I'm associate dean for you know inclusive excellence, diversity, and belongings, there have been voices that have told me you can't accomplish this, you can't achieve this, and rising above that. And I think, like you said. We are women of color. And so there's a very intense narrative in these system system spaces that can really deter people. Um, and so examples like myself and you of, look, we can play chess, not checkers, and really get on the other side of this and, and really be um, in positions where not only we can make sure that um, other people know that that this is attainable, but make sure that their experiences are not laced with those voices in the background. It's so powerful, isn't it, to have these voices and so much so that we then internalize it. And so we're walking around like, I guess I must not be enough because people keep telling me these things that I don't, I can't do it or that it's not important or that my career isn't going to, my, my dreams are not going to happen. So I want to name that because we see, I see you with this like very prestigious title. It's very hard to get at this position list level and to know that you're, we're not alone, that we right. hear this message from systems that are very powerful and even think that as a nursing profession, women dominated, maybe it would be kinder, right? Kinder to us, but actually it's baked into the system right. to be like a handmaiden. And it's so unfortunate because there's so much knowledge there and yet to be less. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And then I also think um, just that added layer of being a young mother mm -hmm. um, and the system that I was in, I you know, because I, I was in the welfare system and I remember telling the like the caseworker who was working with me, like, I'm using this appropriately. I've had a job since I was 14. I'm having hard times. I need to take care of this child. And like keep us afloat. And so I, this is, I'm doing the right thing. And this person like rolling their eyes at me. And then when I got my first job um, at uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute um, as a film runner, and I'm dating myself because we don't use film. We don't throw up films anymore on the, on the light boxes. We actually look at them on the computer. But as a film runner, I remember when I went in and told her, I don't need to be on welfare anymore. I have a full-time job. Her, this person's jaw dropped because even that system didn't ever the voices of yeah you're just another young mom taking advantage of the system and so even that voice from that early on and then to think about you know how far this journey has been and how not easy it's been but also that commitment to make sure that other people know that this is attainable um it's not fair what we have to go through but, um, you know, there's a level of uh, persistence that um, is really important to have. And I don't want to like 
I don't want to highlight like resilience and perseverance because sometimes those things are tethered to us as women of color. Like we should just instinctively know that we need to have these things. Um, one thing that I've adopted uh, recently from the NAP ministry, I follow them on Instagram, is that rest is a form of resistance. So that mm -hmm. self-care that I never allowed myself on that journey because I was busy taking care of a child, um, at one point busy being a wife, um, busy taking care of patients that I never actually afforded or accounted myself the rest that I deserved along that very difficult journey. It is quite a renegade thought, isn't it? Especially back in the 90s or when we were starting our careers. If we were to rest, what kind of nurse, what kind of educator are you? And how dare you prioritize yourself over your daughter? Who 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 do you think you are? Especially on welfare, what do you think about rest? How dare you? Right. And yet, and yet it is a form of resistance, damn it. Like That's imagine. Right. We're white women, we're people of color out and enjoying ourselves. How much of a, how mad would people be, right? That's to right. see that we are actually free, that we are experiencing freedom and self-worth right. from ourselves, not from others having to tell us that we're worthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So powerful. I wish I'd heard that earlier. <laughs> I know. Well, I wish somebody would have told me that years and years and years ago, right? You know, because that narrative of, of like needing to be resilient is, you know, such a strong narrative and certainly dominated a lot of my story. Um, but I like to highlight it as, um, you know, yes, I, I was resilient and I did like people will say all the time, like, oh, my God, I can't believe how, how far you've come and how, oh, my God, this, you're like, what a difficult journey. And I like to remind people in some ways that's a microaggression that, you know, that my journey as a woman of color, as an as a teenage mother as somebody who had an associate's degree and was told that wasn't enough like the fact that you're you're highlighting like oh my god I can't believe how far you've made it maybe you need to reflame reframe, reframe that and say as difficult as the systems have made it for you it's amazing to see where you where you where you you landed where you are because I know that that perseverance was there because systems were bearing down on you. That kind of an acknowledgement is a, is a lot kinder, in my opinion, than somebody who's like, wow, I can't believe how far you've made it, you know? It's interesting because along this journey, yeah, not only did you have perseverance, obvious work ethic and obvious resource pulling, and it's almost like having to push Goliath, right, to, to overcome the system. Were there any other experiences, advice, mentors, anything that you pulled along the way that you're just like, gosh, this was really helpful. In addition to my gifts, in yeah. addition to all of that, I'm curious if you could pull one or two examples that you want to share with us. Uh, especially for nurses of color, like we're so few and far between in many spaces that we have to realize that our mentorship doesn't always necessarily look like us, even though we would like it to. Um, and so my very first mentor uh, was a woman, uh, is a woman, I shouldn't say was, she is still here with us and I love her to death, and um, is a woman named um, Kim Noonan. She is uh, the lead nurse, one of the lead or is the lead nurse practitioner at uh, Dana-Farber. I started working at Dana-Farber uh, when I was 20, um, not long after I had my daughter, six months after I had my daughter. And I, I worked in, like I said, as a film runner, and then I worked my way up the ranks in multiple roles, but mostly supporting nurses and physicians and patients and coordinating visits and whatnot. And one day, Kim came by my office and asked me what I was doing. And I, I thought she'd be like prying. And I'm like, what do you think I'm doing? I'm working. <laughs> and she said, no, no, like, what are you doing with your life? And then I was kind of like taken aback, like, what, what is she talking about? And she said, I see qualities in you uh, where you could be a nurse. And here's how you do it. And she told me to get my associate's degree first. And the reason why she told me that is she got her associate's degree first in a totally different field, but got her associate's degree first and then was able to build off that similar to what I did. So I, in my mind, I initially thought, you know, and Kim said to me, get your associate's degree and then you'll work as a nurse and then go back to school part-time and get your bachelor's and then you'll continue to work and then you'll go back to school part-time and get your master's. 
I thought I was just following her recipe, right? I mean, the wonderful guidance of somebody who saw qualities in me where I could be a nurse, where I didn't really even see that. And so I'm just thinking I'm following her recipe and not knowing that I was going to hit all this like adversity along the way. Um, and, and then I, when I really felt like I had to get this doctoral degree, I called her and I said to her, um, you're not going to believe this. Um, cause she was with me the whole journey and knew how challenging it was. I said, you're not going to believe this. I'm getting my DNP. And she was like, oh, aren't you a glutton for punishment? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. But, you know, again, I explained to her, you know, my why for why I had to do that. And she respected that. A year later, she called me and she said, hey, you're never going to believe this. I'm getting my DNP. And I said to her, wow, look at this. This had look at the grasshopper has become the teacher. And she said, Leah, that's mentorship. I learned from you and you learned from me. And that has always been my relationship with Kim along the journey is this like very reciprocal relationship of us learning from one another. And Kim looks nothing like me. She is a white woman, blonde hair, three children, married, um, you know, very established in her community um, be outside of nursing. And, you know, we have like on paper, you would think that we have nothing in common, but she is really one of like my biggest cheerleaders and supporters for many, many years now. And then I have another mentor who does look like me, a woman of color who was on my um, DMP curriculum committee, along with, with others who uh, really championed me as well. But this particular person um, runs uh, our educational services and our research services for nursing over at um, Mass General Hospital. Her name is Gordia. And um, to see her in action at doing the work that she does um, really was a motivation for me, like, like aspirational, like, you know, she, if she could do this, I can do this. And I'm, I'm, I've been very rough around the edges. I'm still rough around the edges. I'm a little more refined. Um, but very, I was very rough around the edges when I met Gordia and, um, she has really taught me the, um, importance of appropriate restraint, not, she has never told me to, um, to stifle myself or change myself or silence myself. But she has taught me that, again, that chess move on the board is really about patience and time and being thoughtful and methodical about when you take that piece and jump another piece, you know? And um, that that can be done in a way um, that is, uh, um, that can generate inclusivity and belonging. Um, and so I do really feel like, um, you know, two very different mentors, both of whom have taken this young, scruffy, you know, uh, sort of anti-system person, but going along with the system because I knew it would make a better life for myself and for my child and all these things, but have, have really helped me see that I can stay rough around the, the edges, but with some refinement. Um, and, um, so I feel very fortunate and, and these are just two mentors. I've had the opportunity to have dozens of mentors along the way. And, um, several, several of them don't look a single thing like me, don't know what it's like to be a single black mother, you know, as a teenager, but have really rallied around me and supported me as the human and the individual that I am, because they've gotten to know me and they've gotten to know my story and, why my story is so important and how it can actually translate into nursing and academic uh, professions. So I'm very grateful for not only these two um, mentors, but many of the mentors that I've had along the way. When I listen to your story, Leah, one thing that comes to mind is that these mentors did not take the work from you, right? Like I'm going to, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to have you do the work and then I'll be the face. I'll help you fix your problem. But actually, in this example with Kim, she saw gifts. And hey, Leah, actually, did you know that you have all these gifts and qualities? Just to make sure you knew because there's so much out there. And what do you want? What do you want with your life? And I love that she did that, right? She can come in and solve it. Sometimes in our systems, we think we know, right? Let me, Leah, I've got a plan for you. You just follow it, follow my lead, do it, be a doer. 
But in fact, she, she turned it around and said, hey, what do you want? How can yeah. I help you? And let me name that you're already so gifted. Yes. Yeah, they they both um and again many of my other mentors have have amplified me and yeah. amplified my voice. And when I say refinement, like I said, it, nobody's ever told me to not be my full authentic self. Um, but they have reminded me at times, like, okay, you could go about it that way. It might not move the dial the way that you want it. You know, let's take a step back and think and reflect rather than, or, or I've, you know, or I've said, I appreciate your advice, but I'm going up, I'm going to bulldoze through it the way that I want to. And they're still there at the end of the day, supporting me, you know, so never, like you said, um, taking the work, but by helping me find ways to amplify the work and the purpose of the work and the why of the work to make sure that it actually, um, is not only beneficial to me and heart nourishing to me, but also is something that's going to uh, perpetuate and, and 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 affect the community around me, whether it's in the academic setting or the healthcare setting. Leo, you gave this really pointed example with your second mentor that you described, Gordia, and you mentioned that she helped you learn what it means to act with appropriate restraint. I, let's just get into that. What do you mean? I mean, you're a Black woman. Let's just name that. There's all sorts of stereotypes that go along with it. And you've also mentioned that you were rough around the edges, are rough around the edges. And that's just awesome. As someone who is also rough around the edges, I'm like, I love it being authentic. But yet, we want to be impactful. And yeah. that does require some restraint. So can you can you give me a specific example? Where were you trying to figure out, like, I really want to act. Maybe you talked with a mentor, you took a step back, and actually, what does it mean to have impact, but do it in a way that's more, perhaps with more restraint, perhaps with more thought? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on what you just said about Gordia, um, because she was part of my uh, curriculum uh, committee when I was going through my doctoral program. And, um, I had two other individuals plus the chair and uh, the the three people who were on my committee all have PhDs. So again, like this idea of a DNP, which was somewhat new, was also sort of new to them as well because they're PhDs. So they have like, you know, original thought and idea and they, you know, put it out there. And then um, the beautiful thing about the DMP is like, I can catch that that thought and that idea and bring it into a clinical setting or an academic setting and like test it to see if it actually works. So there's a lot of wonderful collaboration that can happen between the PhD and the DMP. But during my journey, getting my doctoral degree, um, ethically, in my opinion, there was um, some concerns that were happening and it was very helpful that uh, Gordia and the other two people on my committee also saw these ethical concerns that my school was was uh, putting me uh, in. I don't want to say they were putting me in. It, there was one school that uh, was sort of putting me in a predicament, and then my school had to uh, uh, had to respond appropriately um, because systems, you know, and how they engage with each other. Um, but there were times where I literally wanted to just call out the program, call out the issues for what they exactly were. And um, I recall Gordia, as well as my other uh, um, committee members saying, like, do you want this degree? I'm like, you know, I've been doing this work. I was doing it as a thesis in my master's. And then I got told you could carry that thesis into your doctoral program because we now have this. So I'd been doing this work for a while. They were like, do you want to finish this program? And I said, yes. And they were like, okay, rather than calling out the issues that you're seeing, we, we're going to acknowledge to you that we see these issues as well. So you're not, no, you're not crazy. Maybe the, the system's trying to make you feel like you're crazy, but you're not crazy. We see this. So that was really good. Like the validation that I, like, that was the, probably the best time where I didn't feel siloed and alone. Like I had people who are accomplished and, and have, have PhDs who see what I see. And they're like, let's do what we have to do to get you through this program. And then if you feel at the end of this program, you need to call up this stuff the way that you feel like you need to call it up, 
we will support you in that. But let's get you through this program. Um, I will say, um, even to this day, I'm probably talking about this more than I have in this space. Um, and so maybe some people might not be happy about it, but I'm happy to fully acknowledge that these things, there were some things that happened in my program for me getting my, de my degree as a, a DNP that were not ethical. But at the end of the day, um, and I thought, oh yeah, we'll get to the finish line. We're going to call all this out. We're going to bring all this up. Um, at the end of the day, I achieved the degree, even from people who said, hey, we have no idea how you're going to use this degree. And like I said, now three, three positions later, I definitely use this degree that sometimes karma is like a beautiful thing in the sense that like, you don't have to like stomp and scream and yell to, to get that um, sweet piece of, of victory. Sometimes um, that sweet piece of victory does manifest in like all these wonderful accomplishments that I have. And I think it was really good to hear the voice of those, those mentors um, say, we see what we we will we see what is happening here. We think it is wrong, but we know that the why of this is to get you over the finish line, and we want to help get you over the finish line. And if after this is done, you want to rah rah about it, we will be right there with you. Um, and maybe you'll think differently when you get over the finish line. And I think for me, I did think differently when I got over the finish line, but it was just that acknowledgement that I had from Gordia and the other two people who are on my committee to, to like not feel alone, to feel supported and to then use the, I could have weaponized this and, you know, made it like made a real ugly scene about it and all that. I now tell people this story um, as a, a way to show my faculty colleagues um, here in the academic setting, as well as my clinical colleagues that these hoops of fire that you put people of color through exist. And they're many times unnecessary and that we will get through them. Um, and it doesn't make it fair that these exist. So what are we going to do um, after hearing a story like Leah's story to make sure that we don't do this to anybody else? And I think that's more of a sweeter victory. And I think that's what Gordia wanted me to see. I think that's what my other two colleagues who were on my committee wanted me to see that, yeah, this is a horrible injustice to you. When you get to the other side, you're going to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else. Yeah, I resonate with that so much because there's so much temptation when something bad happens, especially when it impacts us. You want to just call it out and burn it all down, right? Like, let's just speak our truth. And we talk about that. Like, speak your truth. If you yeah. really were about justice, you'd be speaking your truth. And yeah, there's a lot to speaking our truth. And there's, and we should. And at the same time, there is real impact on us that not just impacts us, but also perhaps could impact others. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't speak out. All I'm saying is we need to consider both sides yeah. and to have the community to be with you, to support you, to validate you and to back you. Yeah. And if you decided later to speak up, yeah. you could have their backing. I think that's so powerful. And, and you, can't, yeah. you can't just like, it, it's, it's often we don't talk about that, the community that supports you, that you can't go it alone. Right. That's right. And I think um, the way I speak my truth is share, like, you know, uh, we talk a lot, a lot about evidence-based practice in our work and uh, lived experience in our work. And um, I think that when I can tell this story in a calm way, um, but still exemplify the hurt that it caused, um, that is speaking my truth. And I think when, when my colleagues whether they're faculty or clinician colleagues, when other students hear this, I think that that truth ends up being a, a mark of a reminder of what not to do, how mm -hmm. not to do it, and yeah. then how we should rise to the occasion and do better. Yeah. And so I end up getting to weaponize that truth in a way to make sure that you know, hey, if your student says that they feel like they're being othered in the classroom, maybe take the opportunity to believe them. Because mm -hmm. if you are an only person of color 
in a mostly white organization and the only people you can go to are white people to tell your story to, there takes a lot of bravery in that and courage in that. And rather than saying, are you sure it's, it's you sure it's not you and it's, 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 you know, versus, you know, maybe you're just interpreting this the wrong way, but actually saying, hey, we see this and we acknowledge this too. We're going to help you get through this. It's a totally different way to uh, maneuver the system um, than, you know, making a scene. And sometimes you got to make a scene. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes I will. So <laughs> it's interesting, Leah, because you went from being anti system to how do you work in the system? And that's yeah, really I'm, I'm a covert agent. Um, covert I'm, agent. A, yeah, I'm a covert agent in, so, so in all these talk systems. About this, um, Leah, uh, I want to go into your D, D, and I work. And I'm curious back when they said, How are you actually going to get paid, promoted? This is not going to help your career. And it has been an important topic. I'm glad that you're the associate dean at Boston College. Focusing on this, how do you think? we're doing on, is, is D and I working? We have people who are, you know, for the past year is really backing, this is important to us, Black Lives Matter, let's start to form a committee, let's have a D and I statement, let's, you know, have a hire, that's the chief DI officer. So let's, let's assume that that's happened, right? Like hopefully organizations have moved to that and maybe changed some of their policies. Do you feel like it's working? What, and specifically, what is missing? If you could go into organizations and wave a you know, magic wand and say, yeah, this could really transform. Of course, obviously we need a whole boatload of changes, but if you could say, really from my research, from my own practitioner experience, if organizations could do one or maybe two things, here's where you would really lean in. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a it's a both and kind of thing, right? So we know, uh, you know, we were all stationary in 2020, nine plus minutes of watching George Floyd be murdered. That moved a lot of people to prioritize DE and I. We also know that there are a lot of places that did prioritize DE and I, and they no longer have that DE and I person who's leading. Um, a lot of that is in more mostly corporate world. Um, we also know that right now, present day, DEI is completely under attack. We know if you're in certain states, you can't even talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can't use those words. We know books are being pulled off of shelves um, because of this, this concern about critical race theory and making people feel bad about who they are rather than confronting the, the realities of our history, right? Um, for me, DE&I in nursing is absolutely imperative. It's always been imperative. Um, one of the things that I said when I was getting my doctoral degree, and this is, I, I, I this still rings true. And, and I think I should also preface this by saying a lot of the things that I'm saying with my doctoral degree were things that I was saying when I had my associate's degree, people just put more weight to it because I have more alphabet soup behind my name. That's fine. And also that's not cool, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, when I was originally doing my, my DNP work on cultural competence in nursing education, I was, and I still may, remain very focused on the fact that mostly white nurses are educated and we have to make sure that they know what they're doing and what they're not doing when they're taking care of diverse populations. Because that can be the difference between somebody's health and somebody being very unhealthy. And that's horrible, that's scary. And if we can get um, our white nurses to rise to the occasion and prioritize DE&I, just like preventing falls, just like managing pain, um, I think that this, I think nursing really does have, um, you know, this in the side pocket in terms of really putting um, health equity as a at the forefront, because that's what we're that's our what our charge is to do anyway. That's always been in our code of ethics through our American Nursing Association. You know, is caring for everybody equally uh, and equitably. Um, and so, for me in nursing and and my approach to DEI in nursing is that we now have multiple bodies that govern what we do in nursing education as well as clinical care that are on board 
with DEI. So, for example, um, the National um, League of Nursing, which uh, helps govern uh, nursing education, has a DEI toolkit that we can use in academia to make sure that we're addressing this in our coursework. Um, the American Nurses Association is on a racial reckoning journey. And they actually, I was actually at the conference, the National Black Nurses, National Black Nurses Association conference uh, last May, uh, May 2021, uh, where the ANA came and talked about that racial reckoning statement. And there were nurses that were there who said, hey, it's about time. There were nurses that were there who said, and these are black nurses, there were black nurses who said, what can we do to make sure that this is amplified? And then there were some black nurses who were like, you can take your, your statement and shove it up your butt. It's long overdue. Um, but the beautiful thing about nursing and nursing education is that we have um, governing bodies that, that really are highlighting their commitment and their concern and the need to address this in the, both the academic setting and the clinical setting. So I'm golden because I, when people say, hey, um, we don't really know if we can talk about like racialized medicine, really? Well, the ANA says we can, NLN, NLN uh, says we can, and other organizations, ACNN says we can. And not only do they say we can, but they're saying we have to, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there was a document written, a very a lofty document, an important document written by the National Medical Association uh, in 2021 called the future of nursing charting a path to health equity so you're so this group is is basically saying nurses have the capacity to chart a path for health equity so for me I'm like this is I'm golden like to be in this kind of an inaugural position in a school of nursing with all of this support from mothership organizations this makes sense in this space. Are we winning in terms of, or are we gaining ground in terms of like the larger landscape? I would say in some spaces, no. Um, Cause again, you know, like, you know, many corporations hire DEI people and then those DEI people are very tethered um, by what the board wants or what even higher leadership wants. And so if it's not an alignment, they can only go so far. Um, and if they don't have governing body documents like I do in nursing, um, you know, maybe they can't go even farther than as far as they'd like to. Um, I think with the tone of this, the world right now, we cannot stop the momentum. And it bothers me that it feels like um, we need to have another nine minutes of stasis to mm -hmm. watch a Black body be disrespected to and lose life to then find momentum in this, uh, when the momentum was in this, when uh, we came here as, as slaves in this country, mm -hmm. the momentum was in this when we came here, when uh, we were brought here against our will um, and treated as poorly as we've been. And that has consistently threaded throughout our existence on this land, um, that we came to this land and took this land from indigenous individuals who suffer greatly in healthcare, um, horribly when it comes to like um, basic care around diabetes and renal care and, and uh, maternal health. So for me, this is like a no brainer. Um, it it, it kind of stinks that everybody's sort of getting with the program now, um, but better late than never. And thank you for giving me foundational documents that support the work that I'm going to do rather than it just being my lived experience that where, like I, you know, like I said, I tell people I'm a walking, living, breathing healthcare disparity, young mother, hypertension, father who died of a heart attack, mother who had a stroke, who thank God is better. But all of these things, these realities that, that people read in um, documents have, ex have been, ex I have experienced in my own life. So I'm grateful that I can lead with the personal stories, but I'm also really glad that at least in my profession, I have foundational mothership organizations that are basically also saying that nursing needs to rise to the occasion. Um, so in my world, I think, yes, this is attainable. It's important. And it's something we have to do in other spaces. I do worry that um, some of that checkbox mentality is happening and like, oh, we went to a training and Yay. And then you move on with, with your thing, uh, with your life. And it 
doesn't, it's not as impactful as it was on the day that you heard the information. Um, I get the opportunity to find ways to thread this through curriculum and to make um, this a priority so that my dream is not only nurses of color, but that white nurses will go out and say, I learned something completely different at Boston College and that is not happening here in this hospital that I'm working in. And either I want to be part of creating that change or I might have to find a different place to work because it doesn't align with the nursing education that we got at, at, at Boston College. And I hope to contribute to that mindset that our students have. I love that you're raising system change makers, just like you, who was anti-system going into systems. How do we then have the motherships also embrace what we want so that we can be the change. So yeah. it's so wonderful, Leah. Leah, let's move on to lightning round questions. Are you ready? Okay, sure. Chocolate or vanilla? Uh, vanilla. I, I like vanilla like tea, tea in my tea. I don't eat ice cream because I'm lactose intolerant, but vanilla, yeah. Cooking or takeout? Cooking. Climb a mountain or jump from a plane? Climb a mountain. <laughs> Have you ever worn socks with sandals? No. <laughs> no, it's a fashion faux pas to me. <laughs> Karaoke skills on a scale of one to 10. 10 being where I carry. Nobody would ever want to hear me sing. So my karaoke skills are limited to rap, hip hop, doing a hip hop track. What's the reason? Which I would gladly do because I was actually a, a hip hop journalist in a previous, a freelance hip hop journalist in a previous life. What's a recent book you read? Um, I am currently reading um, My Grandmother's Hands. Um, and it is a very powerful, powerful book. I'm reading it in a book club. I'm a little ahead of um, my colleagues because it is such a great book. What's your favorite way to practice self-care? Um, so sleeping, <laughs> sleeping and dancing, two totally different things, but I love to, I love um, dancing and listening or attending live music. And um, I recently, unfortunately was diagnosed with long COVID and fatigue is, is my um, unfortunate manifestation of that. So sleeping is uh, very helpful for me as well. What's a really good professional development program you've done? Um, well, I'm part of this, um, you know, culture, uh, this COLE program. And so we just had our, um, we just had a, a big um, conference. I'm trying to look for the um, the agenda. I don't, I think it's not on my desk, but um, that was a very transformative um, experience to hear uh, from the other cohorts as well as the other um, groups underneath um, the umbrella of that organization and what they're doing with data and what they're doing in terms of like um, bringing TRHT into um, schools, of, uh, uh, into colleges and whatnot. So that was really impactful. But, but while we were there, we went to uh, the National African American History Museum and a bunch of us got to bump into Angela Davis. And that just was like sign upon sign upon sign of you're going in the right direction, Leah. <laughs> What's your definition of a boss mama? Um, my daughter and I are, you know, we're 19 years apart. Uh, so, and we're very similar in ways and also very different in ways. She's She's been able to experience her youth in ways that I haven't. Um, and just seeing her take, you know, skills from my, myself and uh, my ex-husband and her grandmother and her uncle um, and just really um, creating the human that she is and, and like supporting that is is to me uh like a boss mom move is in and to finally get to a place where she and I are um really feeling connected with each other um uh, because we've led very different lives you know but now she's getting older and feeling very connected with each other and looking at her pearls of wisdom and knowing that some of that came from me um is i think that's that's boss mama what advice would you give your younger self how oh. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I would give my younger self is like, don't listen to those voices in the background. 
um, you know, even in my younger years. Um, and I, as I mentioned, my father passed away and he passed away when I was really young. There were a lot of voices. I grew up um, in the suburbs uh, as a black person in the suburbs, kind of challenging. Um, so a lot of like, you're not enough voices. Um, and then just um, reminding, just reminding my young self that you are always enough. Where can we find you? LinkedIn, anywhere else? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's probably the best place to find me for my professional stuff. I'm also on Facebook under my name. And last question, do you have a final ask, recommendation, or any parting thoughts to share? Yeah, I think like the biggest um, parting thought I have is um, don't feel like, you know, try to find a way to be your own covert agent inside systems. There are ways that we can work with systems for sure. And then there are ways where as people of color, the system, it just feels like we know it's set up to not necessarily work for us, but that doesn't mean that we can't find ways to do that. Um, and then however you find the ways to get system to cooperate with you, share that wisdom with the person next to you, beside you, who's coming up behind you, um, whatever it is, share that wisdom with them so that they don't have to experience the same level of, of trauma that you've experienced. Um, and if you know that they're experiencing trauma, be there to support them, to be a cheerleader and let them know like, yeah, this is, I see what you're seeing, totally happening. How are we going to get you through this? I want to be there to help you get through this. So um, being that like sort of 10 fingers where you're boosting somebody up. Fantastic. Thank you so much for these stories, Leah. Great advice. Yes. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. I really appreciate the time.